Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here for WhatCulture.com and let's face it, there's very little better than a great movie villain. I mean, just think about it, where would we be without the likes of Emperor Palpatine, the Joker and Lord Voldemort? In fact, some franchises sell themselves on just how great their antagonists are rather than their heroes. If you've got a great villain then your hero can stand to be a bit wimpy and shallow as the audience will hate the baddie so much that you can get away with trite writing. Yet the films on this list are a little different, as while many of them had exceptional villains, the heroes weren't exactly squeaky clean either. In fact, you could argue that the film is actually about two villains with one of them coming out on top in the end. If it seems a little confusing, that's because it kind of is. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are eight movies that didn't know who the bad guy was. Number 8. John Wick now, This one isn't quite as bad as the others on this list, but it still needs to be mentioned. Now, as we all know by now, the film wants us to root for John Wick because A, he's an absolute badass and an urban legend boogeyman amongst those of the crime syndicates around him, and B, because, well, you shot the man's dog, how can you not have sympathy for him? But yes, let's just take a step back and look at the facts. Yes, the dog is dead, and that sucks absolute hard-boiled eggs, but if you think about this hyper level of emotional manipulation, was actually needed because John Wick is not a good guy. Lest we forget, he's a former mafia assassin who's done and continues to do terrible things to a ton of people. The mafia, despite being good fellas, aren't exactly good guys, and would have had Wick pick off people for no better reason than money and terror which he would have done without qualms for cash. Even after the audience is told explicitly about Wick's past with the Russian crime syndicate and after we watch him maul down legions of dudes, including some that aren't directly involved with his enemies, we're still supposed to view him as something more than an anti-hero. That's more than a little messed up. However, because of all that dead dog, he's topping the list of action movie heroes of the current age. Number 7. Ghostbusters Now, let's just roleplay for a second. Assume that you're a lawyer charged with the task of representing the EPA. All of a sudden, there are claims of a rogue group of parapsychologists capturing ghosts and storing them in an unlicensed, hazardous containment center. Do you think possibly you might react even just a little bit like Walter Peck does in the movie? I mean, yes, he is a bit heavy-handed, but Jesus, these men are literally walking around with unlicensed and barely tested weaponry. Then you've got to look at it like this. I mean, ghosts, do they really exist? Up until now, no one's been talking seriously about them, so why wouldn't you question it when four guys who've all just been fired, who happen to be parapsychologists, are now claiming that they're ghost hunters, or busters in this case? Surely it reeks of a con job, right? And finally, let's all just consider something. Say ghosts are real. Say you have captured them and are now housing them in your safe house. Why can't city officials look around and make sure that everything is above board? Why are you being blocked at every situation and insulted for just trying to do your job? That floating ethereal goop pile over there with a face isn't the only slimy thing here if you ask me. All joking aside though, Peck is most definitely a prick who is completely rash and does things to the extreme, jumping the gun and even trying to shut the whole operation down, but give this guy a bit of a break as he was just trying to enforce the law, right? Number 6. Burn After Reading it's rare that we root for an alcoholic in movies, unless the message of said film is to get them sober, which might explain why audiences found it so hard to root for John Malkovich's character in Burn After Reading. Now, Osborne Cox is a former CIA analyst who loses a disc containing a portion of his memoirs, which, in turn, contains what some might consider to be important information about his prior work experience. This sets into motion a chain of blackmailing and various smoking guns, all culminating, unfortunately, in the misery of Mr. To Osborne Cox. Now, while Brad Pitt, George Clooney, Francis McDormand, and Richard Jenkins, all of which who want something different out of this missing disc situation, are portrayed as bumbling idiots with varying degrees of fecklessness, the guy at the center of it all is actually an innocent dude who is portrayed as a nasty villain. Which, when you actually consider things, couldn't be further from the truth. How would you react if a bunch of random people tried, literally out of nowhere, to blackmail you? They're all calling you up late at night, making threats, intruding your home, and generally just trying to make your life a living hell, and this leads to your constant paranoia, a divorce from your wife, and ultimately a goddamn coma. But yeah, the film tells us that John Malkovich is supposedly the bad guy. Okay, film, sure thing. 
Number 5. Ferris Bueller's Day Off Ferris Bueller's Day Off tries to answer one simple question. What is the ultimate fantasy for a teenager who wants to cut class? Well, surprisingly, the film says the answer is to go outside and have fun with your mates and not, as I'm sure we all know is the true response, to stay inside in your pants and playing Guitar Hero while drinking Buckfast Abbey tonic wine. Just me? Well, this just got a lot more awkward then, didn't it? Brilliant. Anyway, at least my after-work activities don't hurt or bother anyone else, unlike Mr. Bueller, who uses his time to act like the world's biggest dick to everyone he meets. Not only does he bully his best friend into doing all the things he doesn't want to do, but he also makes it his mission to torment his principal, the one guy who actually seems to care about what happens to a student who makes a habit out of air quote sick days. And yet, we're meant to root for Ferris? Why? Why would people want to be like him? I mean, sure, he's escaped school, which I'm all sure we hate to some degree, but he's selfish, he's mean, and actually, all things considered, he's probably going to grow up to be a self-destructive adult. Now, I'm not saying that the principal is perfect, seeing as he goes way beyond his role and breaking and entering into a child's home is one way to get yourself on a register, but his actual crimes before this, of being just a bit hard on his students, is actually no more than his bloody job. He just wants Ferris to stay in goddamn school! Number 4. Happy Gilmore Oh, bloody hell, I can't believe I'm actually taking this film seriously enough to even critique the double villain idea, but here we go, Jesus, take the wheel, let's plough headlong into this monolith of man-children that is Adam Sandler. Now, you'll have heard me before bitching about this lad, but honestly, he's actually incredibly clever. I'm just jealous. He's managed to find a way to make films that are really just product sponsorships that pay for him and his mates to go on holiday. I am in awe of how well he's worked Hollywood, yet have you noticed something? Because he mostly plays the same characters throughout his films, and he's actually just a bit of an ass. Case and point Happy Gilmore, in which he plays a man attempting to win money from a golf tournament to help his grandma. It's a nice, sweet idea on paper, right? Well, it would be if he weren't constantly aggressive, rude, and offers no respect for the sport that he's entering. Now, I get it. Golf is way too uptight for its own good, but you could say that about most professional sports, and so bringing in a rowdy crowd, drinking, and being a nuisance it's actually pretty lame of Happy to encourage. Shooter McGavin is a down-and-out asshole, but at the same time, at least he's just playing the actual game, albeit with an intensity that is totally unnecessary. However, at its base, he just wants Happy out of the sport. Happy, on the other hand, only wants the money and doesn't care how much chaos he causes. They're both as bad as each other. Number 3. Liar Liar Jim Carrey is not the good guy in Liar Liar. I'm sorry, not even by the film's end. Once his character's learned his lesson and promises, cross his heart and hope to die, not to lie to the people that he loves anymore, does Jim Carrey's Fletcher become the good guy. He becomes, at best, an okay guy. But you know who is the good guy? Jerry, who is played off as an evil stepdad for no reason other than the film realizes halfway through that Fletcher needs to actually look better by the end. Jerry has even secured a new life for the neglected ex-wife and son in Boston, so how is he the bad guy? Fletcher, on the other hand, spends two-thirds of the movie looking for a loophole in this whole not-lying thing despite the fact that it's clearly something that his kid wants, and Fletcher would know that if he paid any attention whatsoever to the little squirt. In fact, he only learns his lesson once his and completely spells it out for him. Do you want a guy so incapable of picking up on the most eye-roll worthy of hints to be the legal guardian of this kid? And Jerry has already proved that he wants to spend more time with the soon-to-be stepson than Fletcher ever has. Sure, he's not as good at imitating the claw, but that's only because it was Fletcher's invention. Come on, guys, you have to let Jerry be Jerry. Any way you look at it, Kerry is the bad guy and Jerry is the goody. Number 2. Beetlejuice I chalk this one up to an oversight by audiences that love to romanticize the afterlife, Beetlejuice is pegged as the clear-cut villain in this movie, despite his goofball antics. He's essentially the demon spirit from The Exorcist, only with more persistence and a smidgen wackier. But in our haste to crucify this green-haired, pimp-suited monster, we've overlooked the real villains of the piece, Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis, aka Adam and Barbara. After all, they're the petty ghosts responsible for releasing all of that evil. Now, though we may not know where we go when we die, we can be sure of one thing. Once you're dead, property laws still remain. I know it's a very comforting thought, isn't it? Ghosts, no matter how good-natured and sweet, are no longer the owners of their house, and it is sad but true. So when this new family decides to move in and start renovating the admittedly old-fashioned home, that is their right to do so, because they're living people with bank accounts and 
flesh. But the old owners spend valuable energy trying to run this new goth-loving family out of the house because they've been told of some supernatural law requiring them to remain in the residence for 125 years. But rather than bear the thought of someone redecorating what used to be their home, they decide instead to awaken a nearly unstoppable monster to do their dirty work, even though they've been warned against it by veteran ghosts who clearly know a little more about that whole being dead thing. Sure, they end up helping them in the end, but seriously, this is like your mum trying to score a second date with me after giving up the ham on the first date. The damage has been done and it is too late to pedal back. I've seen far too much already. They're evil, is what I'm trying to say, and also that was my one per list. I'm getting flashbacks. And number one, Short Circuit. In this tale of a sentient robot on the run from his creators, Johnny Five represents a ray of hope for humanity. Oh, oh, hold on a minute. Let me just phrase that another way. In this tale of a sentient robot on the run from his creators, Skynet T-800 represents a ray of hope for humanity. Now see how that subtle change might change your entire opinion on this whole rogue AI situation. Although the majority of the movie finds the audiences pitted directly against the security chief in charge of finding and shutting down Johnny, we do have to ask, why? I mean, is it because this robot is kind of funny? Or is it that he represents innocence? Well, yeah, that is all well and good, but what if Johnny was able to soak up something a little less PG and decide that human positives included the removal of humans to save the planet itself? Yeah, now it's suddenly got a little darker, right? It's not like he's got a good teacher either, as the most that she ever teaches him is that dead things stay dead. Now, with that knowledge, he now knows the most permanent way to stop the government agency from disassembling him to use the built-in laser cannon that he's got. That's utterly terrifying. Yes, the chief wasn't all jovial and fun, but you know what? As I've said before, he was technically just doing his job and making sure that the Earth wouldn't be obliterated by Tin Pot Tommy Terror over there. Jesus. And there we go, those were eight movies that didn't know who the bad guy was. Let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. But before we go, my friend, let us talk about something else. You should not be your own worst enemy. You should not be your own worst bad guy, because you know what, my friend, whatever you are getting up to today, whatever your walk of life, you are a good person and you deserve love and happiness, all right? And if you're struggling with that, please ask for help. Talk to someone. Trust me, people care so much more than you realize.